Uh, welcome Ruth Baker to give this plenary talk this morning. Ruth, she uh, got her PhD from Oxford University in 2005 and she's now a professor and heading her own lab at University of uh, Oxford. She's also affiliated with the Queensland University of Technology in Australia, which she visits on a regular basis. And there she also co-supervises PhD students and in fact she has uh, has supervised or do supervise more than 20 uh, PhD students already. Uh, she has given talks all over the world. She has an impressive track record. She has more than 120 published papers, of which many are in uh, nature and science, very high level uh, journals. In 2014, she was awarded the uh, London Mathematical Society Whitehead Prize for outstanding contributions in mathematical biology. I think we are very lucky to have her here today, and uh, please welcome her. She will talk about uh, cell uh, processes. Um, thank you, and I'd also just like to take this opportunity to thank the organisers for the invitation to speak. It's a, it's a real privilege. So before I get oh, going to appear like that. Before I get started, um, I just want to, to, to do the acknowledgements part of my talk, um, partly to make sure that I don't run out of time to do this properly, and partly really because this has been a, a very much a collaborative effort, and I want to hammer that home right from the start. So really, the main collaborator on this work is Matt Simpson from QUT, who many people will know. He's been involved uh, all the way through, and this is very much as much his work as is mine, and he could definitely give this talk. Uh, also, and probably do a better job of it than me. Um, and I should also say that all the data I'm going to show in this talk comes from uh, Matt's lab, and I'm very grateful that he shares that with me. Um, people who, who did a lot of the work involved in this are uh, Debbie Markham, who was a PhD student in Oxford a few years ago, and also the later parts of this, uh, this talk where all uh, can be attributed to the work of Andrew Parker, who is here, so I definitely encourage you to speak to him. Um, we have worked on the sort of topic that I'm going to talk about for quite a long time now. I'll come to that in a minute. Uh, and so as such, I'd want to also acknowledge Robert Ross, Stuart Johnson, and Kit Yates as people who've contributed to the broader work we've, we've done in this area. Um, so if you're interested, also look at work they've done. Before I go sort of into the main science part of my talk, one of the things I'd like to do is um, go back to that theme of collaboration and uh, I think in the same vein that Julia gave some hints for so kind of a successful career in math biology, maybe just say something um, about uh, sort of the power of collaborations and also um, to thank the SMB and the ESMTB uh, in playing a huge role in the collaboration that I have with Matt. So we met, uh, this is actually our 10-year ten ten anniversary, we met 10 years ago at the SMB SIAM Life Sciences meeting in North Carolina. Uh, and then from there, I went on to spend six months in Melbourne working in the same group as Matt. Um, after that, we next met at the SMB meeting in Toronto, and this is really where we started talking about all the work that I'm going to present today. Um, on from there to Vancouver, uh, to Poland, uh, to Atlanta last year, and now finally here in Nottingham, we're celebrating 10 years. So, so the more early career researchers uh, present in this audience, one thing I really want to say is that these kinds of meetings are a great place to, to meet and begin to uh, interact with, with people, other researchers who can uh, really shape, shape your career um, and influence the work that you do. So please all go out and talk to one another. It's a very good thing to do. Okay. And now, and now for the science. So here on in, it, it's all about research. So I'm a very big fan of thinking about getting back to basics. So by that, I mean that... Uh, many of us are very interested in studying sort of very complex cell biology processes such as those associated with um, tumour growth, with embryo development, wound healing. So essentially development, uh, disease and repair. And I am sort of uh, clearly a fan of um, the line of thought that um, if we want to study these processes we should go back to basics and really in a very simple way uh, or within a simple assay try to understand how mechanisms such as fertility, proliferation, adhesion and cell death combine to facilitate tissue development, regeneration and repair. And so that's really what I want to focus on today. 
And what I want to focus on is using very simple in vitro experiments to try to tease apart these relative roles of maternity, proliferation, and death in contributing to the growth of, of cell colonies. And so what I want to do now is just describe to you three different types of assays that we've considered um, that will very much provide the motivation for, for the work I'm going to present. So the first one is a barrier assay. And I sort of think about this as initializing a, a population of cells, growing them to, to some density within a cookie cutter. And then when you're ready, you lift the cookie cutter uh, away and you watch as the, the cell population proliferates. It moves, expands uh, to fill the available space. So you might think of this as having some relation, uh, very tenuously perhaps, to, 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 to tumor development. The next uh, assay we often think about is a scratch assay. So typically here you grow a population of cells to confluence and you make a sort of scratch, you literally remove a, a sort of a, a, a bunch of cells across the middle, in this case of the, of the assay, and then you watch as the cells proliferate, move, and uh, fill the available space. And often thought of as being something that could be representative or used to study a wound healing process. Then finally, we can think about the, maybe the most simple assay of all, and that's a growth to confluence assay. So the idea here is to, simp uh, to see the population of cells relatively um, sort of uniformly uh, within a dish, and then just watch as they, as they simply uh, proliferate and, and, um, and move around and, and, and grow to confluence. And it's these guys I'm going to focus on uh, today. And I should say that you can uh, conduct these experiments both with single and multiple cell types, learning about individual properties of cells, but also how they might interact and, and compete with one another. Okay, so it's a bit of a long aim that I've written down for this talk. Effectively, what do I want to do? I'm going to think about these growth to confluence experiments. I'm going to outline a number of methodologies that I can use to quantify the relative roles of motility, of proliferation, and cell death, or apoptosis within the system. Um, and it's all going to be within the greater confluence uh, environment. In order to interrogate these kinds of experiments, what I want to do is describe to you a hierarchy of coarse grain models to describe them. They're going to be models on different scales and of uh, sort of different complexity. So ranging from uh, ODE to PDE and also individual base models. But the key thing that they are linked and there's a clear sort of uh, steps that you take from getting from one, one model to the next. Okay, so the aims. I'm going to describe the formulation of three uh, models for this growth to confluence experiment and I'm going to try and be very clear about the assumptions made within them. I'm going to explore the ability that we have to infer model parameters within a Bayesian setting for these growth to confluence experiments. Um, and then I'm going to think about how to choose the most appropriate model for a given experiment. So very much thinking along the lines of, if I could, I'd choose the most simple model possible. Um, perhaps it's got an analytic solution. Um, but if, you know, I need to think about when that model is appropriate and what impact um, that, that choice of model has. Uh, and then very, very quickly, at uh, the end, I want to sort of talk about some extensions to other experimental setups. Okay, so here's the modeling part. I'm going to describe the three models to you. Okay, so what am I working with? I've got, going to have three models, and model one is going to be a discrete, on lattice, uh, volume exclusion, essentially agent-based model. So I've got a square lattice that I put down on the system, uh, and the lattice spacing is going to be... Uh, called delta, and that's roughly the size of an individual cell in my experiment. So the idea is that then this lattice is volume excluding for cells in the sense that I can have at most one cell in every site of the, of the lattice. Okay. My initial conditions, I want to replicate a growth to confluence experiment. So they're essentially going to involve uh, sort of seeding each site uh, sort of, um, or populating each site uniformly at random with a given probability. So essentially just generate a random number and use for each site and use it to figure out whether it's populated or not. And typically uh, in everything I'm going to show today, I'm going to populate the sites uh, initially maybe 1% of sites or 3% of sites, something like that. Um, and then there are a number of event events essentially that can take place within the system. So the first thing is that uh, the cells are motile, so they 
essentially uh, with rate PM try to undergo motility events. So when they do that, they decide they want to move. So this cell here might decide it wants to move. And it's going to pick one of its four nearest neighbours, so up, down, left or right, with equal probability and attempt to move into that site. And the key thing is that because this is a volume exclusion uh, model, uh, if a cell attempts to move into an occupied site, that movement event is aborted. So in this context, this cell couldn't move uh, left, but it could move up, down, or to the right. Okay, same thing applies to proliferation. So if a cell wants to proliferate, well, it tries to do so at rate PP, um, and then it'll attempt to place its daughter cell onto one of the nearest neighbor latter sites, and it will abort that proliferation attempt if the nearest neighbor latter site is full. And finally, also just to include uh, cell death or apoptosis at rates PD. So that's very simple, I just remove the cell when it decides to die. Okay, so the model is really, really simple. None of the models I'm going to talk about are particularly te technical today. Um, and I can use a number of simple computational algorithms to generate essentially realizations or sample paths from the system. Um, and one of the nice things in a way about this model is that I can store as much information as possible, okay? So, or I get as much information as possible. I can store the position of every cell at every time on this, on this lattice. Um, so you can just see here results of a, a simulation, again, very, very simple. On a 2D lattice, most things I'm gonna show you are gonna be 2D results. Um, initially, 1% of the site's full, and you can just watch as the, as the, the lattice site, the lattice grows to confluence. So here, I've uh, taken uh, PM to be 1, PP to be 0.1, and no death. And in fact, throughout this work, um, I'm always going to take PM to be 1, and I'm going to scale everything relative to that. Okay. Um, so although it's nice uh, that I can collect as much information as required, the positions of all the cells at all time, sometimes it's too much information. It's, it's sort of too high-dimensional and I collect a summary statistic of that data uh, in order to kind of make sense of what's going on. So in this context, one of the things I would, I'll usually do is to then, for a given simulation, count the total number of cells on the lattice and use that as my summary statistic. So here, for a value of PP being 0 0.005, I've just plotted, averaged over a number of realizations, the, uh, the density, uh, so what fraction of lattice sites are full um, and how that evolves in time. Okay, so in all of these plots, there's no death, so it's very clear that the lattice is just going to fill uh, up over time, and also that effectively, as I increase the proliferation rate, um, the lattice fills up more quickly. Um, so that's very much uh, as expected, and all of this is, is very simple. The other thing I could do um, is I could think about how to compare simulations with different proliferation rates on the, same, on the same plot. And if I want to do that, then a useful thing to do is to rescale time. Okay. So here I'm rescaling time and, and, and using a time scale that's effectively sort of the expected number of proliferations, if you like, per unit time or the a sort of per capita growth rate per individual. Okay, so I've sca rescaled uh, time and that allows me to plot all these density uh, curves on the same on the same axis. Sorry. Okay. So what you see here now is that essentially these these are sort of all curves where they're, they're tending to t tending to one den in density over time. But as I increase the movement rate, uh, sorry, the proliferation rate relative to the movement rate, then the lattice on this rescale time scale fills up less quickly. Okay. So maybe that's sort of slightly counterintuitive, and I'll come back to that in just a minute. The main thing to highlight here is that um, is what the take-home message is that essentially things aren't sort of on this rescale time scale are not sort of identical. They change with the proliferation rate. Okay. So that's my first model, model one, the discrete model. And um, now I want to think about coarse-grained versions of it. And the reason I guess I want to do that is if I want any insight into what this model is doing, I effectively have to run a whole bunch of simulations and then collect some summary statistics about it. There's no analysis possible. So let's think about model two, which is a very, very simple mean field model and is some coarse-grained description of this process. Okay, so here 
I'm going to de de derive an ODE description of the total cell density, and I'm going to describe to you how to do that in, in one dimension. So I'm going to use uh, CL to be the probability that a lattice site L um, is occupied by a cell at a given time. So then I can clearly see that I get changes in the occupancy of site L because um, cells move into and out of, uh, out of the site, or they proliferate and drop their daughter cells into that site. Okay, and also as death. So here, just to very quickly explain, the term that looks like this is sort of saying, well, I have a, I have a cell at site L minus one. It decides to proliferate with rate PM. With probability one half, uh, it decides it's gonna try and drop its, um, uh, sorry, with probability PM, it's gonna try and move into site L. And I only get a change in occupancy at site L if L was, is, was uh, unoccupied before. So I just have this conservation statement that looks at the change in probability that uh, site L is occupied with time. So I can simplify this model. First of all, just remove uh, a bunch of terms uh, that, that, that just cancel. And then I can take a limit, which is very usual to do as the lattice spacing tends to zero. So I'm sort of thinking about zooming out on this process really at that point. And I end up with a, a usual sort of very standard uh, reaction diffusion PDE, uh, uh, sort of a Fisher's equation effectively if I rescale. Um, and I know that for this particular experiment I'm thinking about, there are initially no spatial density gradients. So I initialize the cell population uniformly at random within the system. And so effectively I can get rid of the diffusion term and just think about an ODE um, and just a logistic growth equation effectively to describe evolution of the average occupancy of the lattice with time. Okay, so that's all very, very simple and we can solve this uh, equation analytically. So let's compare the results between the two. Let's compare what the predictions are of uh, model one, the discrete model for a given set of parameter values with the output from the logistic model, this mean field model uh, for the same parameter values. So I'm always gonna plot uh, the discrete results in black and the mean field results in red in this talk. So you can see that if the proliferation rate is very low relative to the movement rate, then basically this mean field model does a really good job at predicting the average dynamics of the discrete model. But as I ramp up the proliferation rate relative to the movement rate, it does an increasingly bad job um, and is always over predicting the population density at any time. And I should say this is results for for, for no death in the system. So I'm always gonna sort of, both curves are always gonna hit one in a long time, but really I'm, I'm, the, the, the mean field model is not doing a very good job at picking up the transient dynamics. Okay. Uh, yeah, so that's, that's maybe sort of fairly obvious. The other thing that we can do though is just to, to rescale time again to look at all these plots on the same axis. So if I do the same sort of time rescaling I did before, then uh, I just end up with a non-dimensionalized logistic, uh, logistic growth uh, equation, which I can again just solve. So solution to that is just this red curve that you can probably see over here. And then all the black curves are these average discrete results. And again, it just shows you that as I increase the proliferation rate relative to the movement rate, I do a very sort of the mean field model does an increasingly bad job at picking up the transient dynamics. Um, okay, so that's what I just said, I think. All right, so what happens when we add death back into the mix? So all the results I've showed you so far have been without death. Let's put it in there and see how far that affects things too. So in all of these plots, they're on a rescale time scale and I've always set death to be half the proliferation rate, um, just for argument's sake. So you can see what, two things really. Uh, when both the proliferation rate and the death rate are relatively small, then the mean field model is doing a fairly good job at predicting the dynamics. But as you up the proliferation rate and the death, uh, death rate relative to the movement rate, you get two things happen. You no longer pick up the sort of the transient dynamics, but also no longer predict the steady state either very well. So you kind of lose the sort of predictions uh, in two ways. Okay. So why is that, and was that something that was obvious? 
So essentially, in writing down this model before, when I wrote down terms uh, to describe the change in average occupancy of site L, um, then I did, uh, I did so, and uh, sort of cheekily, and didn't talk about it too much, assumed that the, av the occupancies of neighboring sites are uncorrelated. So I said that the probability I have a movement for the cell from site L minus one into site L is just the probability of L minus one being occupied, that L isn't occupied, multiplied by the probability that the cell attempts to move. And clearly, uh, in some parameter regimes, so like the one I showed you right at the start of this talk, that's probably a relatively appropriate assumption to make. But if I up the proliferation rate relative to the movement rate, you can see clearly that that's not, not going to work and it's not going to hold. So I get these real patches and clumps of cells on the lattice, um, and they're having a massive impact uh, on essentially evolution of the population. Okay. So the sort of the short story is that model two, whilst it does an effective job at predicting the dynamics of the discrete model, in some parameter regimes it doesn't do very well in, in many. So can we sort of attempt to fix that? And what's the sort of next best uh, model that we could write down? So that's going to be model three, and I'm going to call it a moment dynamics model. So what's the idea? Uh, the idea here is that instead of just thinking about the occupancy of single lattice sites, I want to think about also the occupancies, probability, sorry, of pairs of lattice sites. Okay. So I'm going to now use some notation. So row one is always going to describe what's the probability that I have a cell in a given lattice site. So this guy just says, what's the probability I have a cell uh, in site L on my lattice? Uh, and then I'm also going to think about the occupancy probability of pairs. So these are going to be the row twos. And so this, this thing basically is, what's the probability that I have a cell at site L on the lattice and also a cell at site M on the lattice? Okay. Um, and then uh, sort of analogously, this is just the probability I have a cell at L and nothing at M on this lattice. So now can I write down evolution equations for these probabilities effectively? So let's think about single sites. Well, it, it just follows in the same vein as before, but now the notation looks slightly different. Okay, so I get a change in the occupancy of site L. So again, this is in 1D. Uh, because what? Because I had a cell at site L minus 1. I didn't have a cell at site L. And then that cell at L minus 1 chose to move into site uh, L. And it attempted movements at a rate here. I also then have proliferation terms, so this is a cell at L minus 1, nothing at L that chooses to drop its daughter cell into site L, etc. So really just the take home message without reading kind of every term in this equation is, is now that the evolution of single site occupancy probabilities depends on the, uh, on the pair site occupancy probabilities. So then what I need to do is I need to go away and write down how the uh, pairwise occupancy probabilities evolve in time. And it's clear that when I do that, the right-hand side here is going to involve triplet occupancies. So then I could go away and write down how the triplet occupancies change, and that would depend on groups of four lattice sides, etc. So I don't want to keep going down this road because uh, it's not going to be tractable. I'm not going to be able to make much progress. So what I want to do is now simplify this model. So the first thing I want to do is uh, I'd like to use a conservation argument to simplify as mu much as I can without kind of making any assumptions. So just sort of conservation statements that involve adding, uh, for example here, pairwise occupancy probabilities to give me single occupancy probabilities. So I can make quite a lot of progress in doing that, but I can't uh, do anything about, for example, in this equation, uh, these guys and within the, uh, the, the equation for the row twos, I can't get rid of all the row threes. So I need a closure. So really all the closure is gonna allow me to do is to write the triplet uh, site occupancies in terms of uh, pairwise occupancies and single occupancy probabilities. Um, and for those who are interested, we use the Kirkwood closure, uh, but it, it, can be, um, it can be sort of a range of closures and they'll, they'll work fairly well. So the result now is you've got a fairly large system of ODEs to solve, but you know, you can do it. Um, it's not particularly tractable analytically, but, but, you, but you can work with this system. Um, 
But however, there are some more simplifications that you can make. So the first is to recognize that this system is translationally invariant. And by that, I mean that I start initially with no spatial structure on this lattice. And so if clusters build up, then the probability of a cluster at some point on the lattice is just the same as the probability of having a cluster somewhere else. So in other words, this means that my, my, um, my pairwise uh, sort of occupancy probabilities don't care about where the two sites are on the lattice. They care only about the distance between them. Okay, so it's a real sort of simplification. That allows me to do two things. The first thing is now I can work with an average site density. I don't care where the site is on the lattice. Uh, and the other thing is that I can simplify terms that have got row 2 in them to say, well, they can be products of row 1s times essentially a correlation function that tells me what's the, as it says on the tin, what's the correlation in occupancy probability between two sites and noting that that only depends on the distance between them. Okay, so for, for sort of just to, to ground that, then if two sites are completely independent of one another in terms of their occupancy, then F is 1. And what we expect to see in this kind of uh, situation is that sites often become positively correlated, at least at uh, short distances, so F will be greater than 1. So what's the, sort of, what's the result of doing all that? So we get a, 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 an ODE that tells us how the, the site density changes or the average occupancy changes in time. And it looks very much like the one we had before, like the logistic equation, but I've got this extra term in here, which is effectively the nearest neighbor correlations on the lattice site. So to what extent are two uh, nearest neighbor uh, lattice sites correlated in that occupancy? So delta, remember, is the lattice spacing. Okay, so I have to solve that equation, but in order to do that, I need a, then a, a system of equations that describes how the, the correlations evolve over time. So we end up with an ODE for each distance on the lattice. Again, it's a, um, a large system of ODEs, but it can solve it and it can make some simpli simplifications. Okay, so how does Model 3 do in comparison to Model 2, the mean field model, and does it do a good job of replicating the discrete model? Because that's clearly what we're sort of after. Okay, here's the results. So again, I'm going to show you straight to showing everything on a rescale time scale, and um, I'm going to show all the results, okay? Uh, so just to highlight again, the black line is the average discrete results from model one. The red line is the logistic model we described, or the mean field model we described before. And now the blue is the, the moment dynamics model, this most recent model. And really the take home message is that in many regions of parameter space, um, this moment dynamics model does a really excellent job at predicting sort of not only the, uh, the sort of long time behavior of this process, but also the transient dynamics as well. So it's a clear improvement over the, um, the mean field model. All right. So so this is more or less the sort of the end of the introduction to the different models. Uh, I just want to summarize what I've said um, and then move on to think about model parameterization. So we've got a number of models at different levels of coarse graining to describe these processes. Uh, model one is simple to code up. Uh, you can put in kind of arbitrary rules, uh, but in general, there's not much analysis that you can do. Uh, model two is very simple, has an analytic solution, but it's not particularly uh, accurate, which is not usually helpful. Um, and then model three is more accurate, but it's, um, and you can do a bit of analysis, but it's fairly painful to work with. Um, okay, but what? So all the results I've showed you so far have been saying, well, if I input the same parameter values into each of these models, how do the output compare? But I could ask a slightly different question which is, uh, to what extent could Model 2 and Model 3 replicate the dynamics of Model 1 uh, given a free choice of parameter values? And the answer is pretty well, and in almost all regions of parameter space. So here what I've done is, um, say, for example, just here on the, uh, the left, I've thought about um, the mean field model. So the black are some results from the discrete model. And the red solid line is the, the prediction of the mean field model with the same parameter values. 
Uh, but actually, if I uh, perturb and take some different parameter values for the mean field model, I can very well replicate the results of the, uh, the discrete model. Uh, albeit with quite a drastic change, uh, sort of a 25% change in the parameter values. Uh, and I can do the same thing in the moment dynamics model as well. So I can, in effect, always pick parameter values for model 2 or for model 3 that replicate the, the data from model 1, just that the parameter values are, are different. So for me, this motivates uh, two questions. Number one, to what extent can we infer model parameters for each of these models? And the second one, I think maybe importantly, how can we determine which model is appropriate and, and when? So the next two parts of my talk, which are going to be shorter than the first one, um, are going to be very much outlining kind of some work we've done towards answering those questions. Okay, so the inference bit. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to work towards um, being able to estimate, using model one, the discrete model, uh, parameters for the two cell lines I showed you in the growth to confluence experiments before. So this is a 231 breast cancer cell line and a 323 fibroblast cell line. So what I want to do is I want to basically uh, model those, uh, e those growth to confluence experiments using my discrete model and try and estimate the parameter values. <laughs> Okay, but the first thing I'm going to do is to see what extent I can do that kind of just using the data from model one. Let's not jump straight in and try and kind of explore the actual data. Let's see, see uh, let's practice, I guess, first. So what am I going to do? I'm going to use, pick some parameter values, and I'm going to generate some data from model one, and I'm going to call that my in silico data. And then I'm going to explore the extent to which I can infer the parameter values used to generate those data. And I'm going to now work in a geometry in a setup that's kind of similar to the experimental uh, sort of images that we have. So sort of putting down a, a, a lattice over an image, counting numbers of cells and uh, working from there on. So to do parameter inference, I'm going to work in a Bayesian framework where I want to uh, essentially get a handle on the posterior. So what's the probability of the parameters given the data uh, and... Um, I understand that that's uh, essentially proportional to uh, sort of the product of the likelihood, so the probability of the data given the parameters uh, multiplied by any prior information I have about the, the values the parameters can take. Okay, so I need to use an approximate Bayesian computation to do this because the likelihood is intractable. So I'm going to kind of explain how we did that in a minute. But a key question I'm going to need to answer along the way is which summary statistics were informative. So right back at the start of this talk, I sort of hinted that if I collected all the information available from model one, the discrete model, that it would just be essentially too much to deal with. It's too high dimensional. So in that sense, to use uh, essentially ABC, I'm going to need to think about what summary statistics of the data are useful um, and in what context. Okay. So what I'm just going to use... Uh, yeah, so here we go. Uh, I'm just going to use ABC rejection and... Effectively, it's very simple, and all it involves is doing the following uh, a lot of times. So I'm going to sample some parameter values for my prior. So effectively, I'm just going to pick PM and PP, I'm going to forget about PD, uh, uniformly from uh, sort of within some, within some uh, limits. Uh, and then I'm going to simulate the model using these parameter values. And then the next step is just to evaluate how close the model output is to the, the in silico data I generated. And I'm going to do that using a summary statistic, uh, S, so here, and a distance function, D. They, they can be obvious, and I'll describe them in a minute. Um, and then when I've done that a very large number of times, all I'm going to do is rank these parameter sets uh, according to, to this distance function, um, and then I'm going to take the top 1% of them and use them to form uh, a posterior. Okay, so my computer's really slow and it might take some time to move between these slides. Get there in a minute. So the first thing I'm going to do when it thinks about it, may or may not. Okay. Uh, the first thing uh, I'm going to do is show you sort of how we did this, where, think, where we think about using the cell number as a summary statistic. So essentially, I told you it's low. Oh dear. Go back. Okay. So we're using the summary statistic uh, of the cell number. 
So what do we do? We, uh, we um, generate a lot of parameter sets, we run the model, and we count the number of cells in each of the experiments. Um, and then that we compare that to the in silico data that we've generated. It's not looking good at this point. It's trying to go backwards. Here we go. Okay. So we do that maybe 10,000 or 100,000 times. And we take the top 1% of parameter sets that have a cell number that's close enough to the in silico data. Uh, and so on this plot here, I'm just showing you the posterior regenerated. So you've got the movement parameter on the uh, horizontal axis and the proliferation parameter on the vertical axis. And then the little white dots that hopefully you can make out are the top 1% of parameter sets. So I think there's 100 there. And then the sort of shading is just uh, essentially a smooth posterior generated from those points. Okay. And the red dot down here that hopefully you can see was the actual parameter values that we used to collect the data. The take-home message, and I'll press to advance to the next slide so that it might happen at some point. The take-home message from this is really that um, we get a lot of information using this summary statistic about the proliferation parameter in this model. Um, so the posterior is fairly, here we go, we can look over here. The posterior is, is fairly sort of tight uh, in terms of the, the, the proliferation parameter. Uh, so looking in this direction, sorry. But I get almost no information about the movement parameter at all out of using this summary statistic. So that tells me that if I do want to, um, if I do want to sort of identify both these parameters or estimate both these parameters in this model, then I need to look at some other summary statistics as well. So then what Andrew did was just went and looked at a whole bunch of summary statistics and determined the extent to which they were informative uh, in terms of our model parameters. And really the take-home message is that you can look at cell number or the pairwise correlation or different measures related to the pairwise correlation and you get a lot of information about the proliferation parameter in this system but virtually no information about the movement parameter. On the other hand, if you can track cells and look at, say, their displacements under whatever metric, then you get much more information about the motility parameter but almost no information about the proliferation parameter. Again, it's thinking about advancing. Here we go. Okay, so really the take-home message from the sort of in silico experiments where that the number of cells or the pairwise correlations tell you a lot about proliferation rates, um, but you need to track cells in order to be able to uh, estimate a uh, motility parameter. Okay, so that was a uh, practice on in silico data. What can that tell us about our ability to infer uh, the model parameters for an experiment. Um, so essentially what our sort of investigation shows is that for these types of experiments, we need to be able to track cells in order to estimate the motility parameter and therefore we need to have information about cell tracks within our model in order to be able to infer the motility parameter. So I said that na they're naturally available for this discrete model because we can easily just tag an agent or a cell and watch it move. Um, they're not currently sort of around or sort of available for the descriptions I showed you of the mean field or the moment dynamics models. Uh, but I think it is possible to extend them in order to do that, and that's something we should probably uh, get around to doing. Okay. Uh, so let's put, it, let's put it all to good use. Again, um, let's go back to the, uh, the two cell populations, and let's use the number of cells and let's track cells and use those, uh, those summary statistics in order to try and infer the model parameters. Okay, and we're going to try and infer the proliferation rates and the movement rates for both the fibroblasts and the breast cancer cell lines. It is getting there. It's just really slow. Okay. So I'm going to show you for four uh, essentially posteriors now. So this column is, is the breast cancer cell line and this is the fibroblast cell line. And what can you see? Uh, you can see again that for using the number of cells as summary statistic gives you good estimates of the proliferation rates and actually tells you that probably the proliferation rates for both these cell types are probably fairly similar, at least in this assay. Okay. Um, and then you can look at the, uh, the distance moved. You can track cells. 
and that tells you that the movement rate of the fibroblasters are almost an order of magnitude or so bigger than the, uh, the motility parameter of the breast cancer cell line. Maybe fairly surprisingly, I'm not sure. Um, just want to highlight very quickly when the cell rolls over that actually uh, the, the, the axes are on these two posteriors are slightly different and that makes this posterior look much more focused uh, around the motility parameter, but it's actually just the, the scale. Okay. So we can estimate uh, parameters for these models and what can we usefully, usefully then do with it. So one thing that we could then do is predict sort of long time density uh, profiles. So how long, for example, does it take sort of for, for these cell populations to reach confluence? And what you see, uh, as you might expect, is, you know, I haven't laid them back to front, is that so the, the dashed line is the 3T3 fibroblast cells and the solid line is the breast cancer cell line, that effectively the fibroblast cell line reaches confluence more quickly than the breast cancer cell line. And really now, if you think about the parameter estimates, this is all due to the fact that the, the fibroblast cells are moving more quickly than the breast cancer cells, so they're opening up space for, for themselves to proliferate into. Okay. And the only bit of data that wasn't generated in MATLAB that I'm going to show in this talk, um, this is basically consistent. I didn't touch anything, I swear. This is con consistent with. Um, oh, no. Medium? Is it okay? Uh, this is. There you go. This is consistent with experiments done quite a while ago um, by Barron and, and Green looking at adding motility promoting factors to. Uh, sort, of, uh, sort of cell colonies and, and observing how quickly they grew with time. Okay, so we've looked at the range of different models and we've looked at whether we can parameterize them. So then the final question that I said I wanted to sort of um, talk about was which model when. And so really what I'm asking now is are there spatial summary statistics that I can apply or that I can interrogate my experimental data with that allow me to distinguish kind of a priori which model might be appropriate. Um, and really what I'm thinking here is when can I get away with a simple model and when do I have to work a bit harder? So this is the spatial statistics part and it's pretty short. Okay. So what I want, uh, thinking about the intuition we've built up, what we want really is a summary statistic that's going to quantify the extent to which we've got clustering present within uh, either a simulation or in this case within the data. Um, so just to highlight, this is sort of the, the growth of confluence experiments. What you see with the fibroblasts is that they fa remain fairly sort of um, homogene homogeneously distributed uh, sort of uh, within the assay uh, sort of over time, whereas with the breast cancer cell line, I can kind of always pick cells that remain sort of quite isolated. I can always find regions of space that sort of don't get occupied by cells, and also I can observe clusters growing. So can I work with a spatial summary statistic that will allow me to detect that that's happening? Okay, so I'm going to describe to you very quickly two summary statistics that I think are quite useful. Um, the first is the agent coordination number distribution. So what do I mean by that? I mean that for every site on the lattice, I'm going to count the number of nearest neighbor lattice sites that are occupied. And I'm going to kind of count the eight nearest neighbor lattice sites in this context. So if the, uh, if the lattice was kind of populated uniformly at random, then the, um, the coordination number distribution would just be uh, a binomial distribution. Um, and so effectively what I need to do is plot for a given density what that binomial uh, distribution would look like relative to what, what I get from the actual data. And you can see sort of just comparing these three lattice sites that have essentially different proliferation rates, uh, that as the extent of the clustering increases, you see a real departure from the, from the binomial distribution. So that provides one uh, maybe quantitative measure of the extent of clustering in the system. So the other, well, one of the other summary statistics we looked at was uh, some kind of scaled variance in particle numbers. So what I mean here is that we're going to take the, uh, the image, we're going to put down a, a large, a coarse lattice or grid over this image uh, that divides the, then the, the, the image up into a number of bins. 
And then you can count the number of cells in each of the bins. And you can generate a scaled variance, which was basically uh, involves, so Q of T is the number of, 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 of cells, and M is the number of bins, how far you are away from kind of having some uh, equal numbers in every bin. Okay, so you can do that for both, for both, uh, both uh, cell types. Okay, and here's what you get. Uh, so you can think about relating this index and its evolution over time to what would happen in the completely spatially random case. So by that, I mean if every cell was equally likely to reside in any of the bins on this course left. And what you see from the fibroblast cell line is effectively they sort of, they're just under actually this completely spatially random case, so they are remaining more or less uniformly distributed uh, on average over, over, the, over, the, over the domain, whereas the uh, breast cancer cell line is actually this kind of significantly higher variance index than the completely spatially random case. So we are seeing these clusters forming over time. So the take-home message from this part of the talk is very much that there are spatial summary statistics that you can use to detect the presence of spatial correlations or clustering within the lattice and that they do provide a quantitative measure of, of the clustering. The downside of that, there's two things I would say, are that the choice of model, though, is still very much sort of subjective. What I end up needing to do is picking a threshold in terms of the, uh, the summary statistic to decide when I need to use uh, model 3 over model 2 or maybe when model 1 is the most appropriate one. The other thing is that I haven't shown the data here, that they actually don't work very well for multiple populations of cells within the same assay. So that's something that's still very much um, on the to-do list. Um, and I think maybe the sort of take-home message is that often working with this hierarchy of models is appropriate so that you can always sort of uh, be sure you're capturing the, the, the right amount of detail. So more or less I, I'm done now, just want to summarise. Um, what I've done today is outline a range of models at different level, levels of resolution, so taking into account or coarse graining to different extents. Um, and they're describing the dynamics of motile proliferative, I can't speak, cell populations in a growth to confluence assay. Um, I've demonstrated that it's possible to infer model parameters um, for this growth to confluence experiment as long as I have access to certain summary statistics. And then I've talked very briefly about how it's possible to determine in advance which of these models might be most appropriate. The real disadvantage, um, at the risk of finishing on a negative note now, uh, about this growth to confluence experiment is very much that I have to be able to track individual cells over time in my assay in order to uh, essentially estimate the, the, the parameters involved within the model. So the question you might naturally ask is whether changing the assay, maybe choosing one of the others I outlined at the start of this talk, might be uh, helpful in that regard. Because in a sense, I think many, maybe many people here who've worked with data and have tried to track cells would tell you that tracking cells in an experiment is really is really the bottleneck and is probably the, one of the hardest things that, that you have to do with the data. So if we don't have to track cells, then effectively um, that would be a real positive. Yeah, so the take-home message really is that let's think about uh, an assay that actually in induces or um, starts with spatial correlations with clusters present in it. And so the scratch assay that I described at the start is probably a, a very, very good start point. And without giving away all the results of Andrew Parker's talk, which you're going to see on Friday, the key sort of um, message is that if I start with an experiment that has got spatial correlations already present, then I can get all the information um, or get very good estimates of both uh, the motility and the uh, proliferation rates within my model using something like the pairwise correlation function, and that does not require me to track cells, so that's uh, a real positive. Okay, uh, I'm going to finish there, just again, thank the people that really did or uh, helped do all of this work. Um, very much appreciated, because it was a real collaborative effort, um, and I'm going to be very cheeky and just plug a conference that Alex Fletcher and I are organising in Oxford in September. I'm not sure I haven't cut the date off. Uh, but just to say, there is the link <laughs> to, to the meeting. We've got a great list of plenary speakers 
and um, there's quite a bit of funding available for early career researchers. Uh, so if you do want to come, uh, make sure you take, check out the website and um, apply for some funding. Uh, but yeah, I want to finish there and just say thanks very much for your attention. for a very nice talk. Are there questions? There's one up there, so one of the young that have to run. So we take one there. Please. I guess those kinds of things are possible and you could do that as well I think when you're thinking about adhesion. Um, one of the things I meant to mention right at the start is that you can apply drugs like mitomycin C in order to stop proliferation and that can therefore give you extra information and that, that's definitely something that's useful to do. We haven't done that with these data at the moment but it's something that we could and we've definitely done it in other contexts. Yeah, yeah. Good, good question and definitely it's something to think about. Thank yeah. you for a very nice talk. Uh, I'm very much interested in correcting that mid-field approximation because you show in the front there are two issues, capturing the transient behavior and also the next and other one, the mid-field approximation fails to predict the steady state. Yeah. Uh, so when you correct these, that mid-field approximation using your technique, is it better in estimating the steady state or, or it still has trouble to do that? Yeah, so it very much um, does do well. I think I showed, uh, sorry, I have to, I think this is the slide. Yeah, so it very much does um, <coughs> much better at capturing the sort of steady state dynamics. So really here, I'm capturing, so, uh, well, to back up, in all of these systems, um, the proliferation rate is, is twice the death rate. Let me just turn the lights down maybe uh, a bit. If I can, for a sec. That's better. So the proliferation rate is twice the death rate. So the mean field model would always predict that half the lattice sites are occupied by cells at any time. But you can clearly see in the discrete model we're way below 50% um, in this case. And so actually our moment dynamics model does pick that up um, but quite nicely. Did that, did that answer the question? I think it was hard yeah. to... Yeah, can I have a follow-up? Follow yeah. Because I was working with a similar model but with a very low density of the particles. How good is the approximation when you've got a really low confidence around the steady state of like 10%? Um, I don't think it's something we've really focused on. The real issue we've got, if you've got a confidence around 10% is that um, there's quite a high probability that the, the lattice will go extinct. <laughs> right, and so you've got to be really careful that when you look at um, these kind of long time dynamics and you average over multiple realizations that you're not, you've got to think about whether you're going to uh, include the ones that have gone extinct or not and, and, and all that kind of thing. So it does a reasonably good job, I think. Um, we haven't, I haven't run those kinds of simulations for a while. But, but my, um, what was I going to say? But, but um, yeah, you do have to worry about an extinction. And actually, Stuart Johnson, um, who I uh, acknowledged at the start of the talk and at the end briefly, has done some nice work looking at um, s sort of kind of um, a kind of a more accurate version of this model and, and can pick up those kind of, would, would pick up that kind of behaviour very well. Uh, so, so I guess in general, I think it does a fairly good job, but you've got to worry about extinction. So there's another question there. Yeah, of course. Yeah, right. So I, I was always starting from the viewpoint. It's a good point. 
um, that, that this model is, uh, is a realistic model. So cells clearly don't live on a lattice and um, maybe we shouldn't treat them as doing so. I guess maybe two offences is number one that um, it's, it's, it is easy to make some analytic progress uh, working on the lattice and the, you know, I think you could extend all this work to off lattice context but it's quite hard and um, it's unclear to me that if you go off lattice quite how much more information you sort of gain I guess. Um, so, so yes, definitely going off lattice. We have thought about it and we have made some attempts at it, um, but it, but it is quite hard. So, um, a sort of a lattice is a nice place to work. Uh, you could also, ask, uh, you know, argue that we should have used a hexagonal lattice or different shaped lattice, and all of that. I think all of this work could be repeated um, if you wanted to. We just haven't, we haven't done it, but it's, it's, it's a very fair point. Sure. More questions? Yes. So when you said the ABC rejection method, you said that you had used a uniform uh, as a priority uh, distribution. Yeah. Did you have any guess for that part? Did we have a guess, did you say? Uh, so we had done some parameter estimation before in a non-Bayesian uh, framework. So we had some idea about what we thought uh, the, the parameters might be. So I guess that meant that you didn't have to take a, uh, an absolutely huge prior, uh, sort of a very wide uh, sort of uniform distribution. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, I guess, I think if you probably, if you didn't capture, um, if, if you didn't have the sort of true parameter or the bulk of the true parameter distribution lying within that prior, I think you'd pick it up when you came to sort of looking at the results because the, 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 the density plots just wouldn't look comparably very good and the error would be high. More questions? Hi, um, just sort of following on from that, I guess, I noticed for some of the summary statistics, your posterior seemed to have the highest density miles away from where the generated parameters were with comparatively low density um, where you actually use those parameter choices to produce the data. Um, so that suggests that for a particular bad choice of summary statistic, a wrong parameterization looks much more like a data than the right parameterization. I was wondering if you could comment on that and if there are any hints to avoid choosing such bad choices of summary statistics. It's a bit of a, uh, yeah, it is, my computer is trying to bring that slide back up. Um, it's a really good point. Uh, I guess one of the motivations really for looking at in silico data first, and this is all results with in silico data, is that that allows you to get a really good handle on what summary statistics are informative. Um, and I think one of the take home points of this talk really should be that in different contexts, different summary statistics provide different amounts of information are, and are uh, useful in different ways. So, I don't know if I can offer any great insight into it so much as uh, more than just saying to, to, to really sort of test your, um, to, to really try and build a model that you think at least captures the salient details of the system so your model's not hopelessly inaccurate and to then really test uh, kind of test your kind of ABC method and test your summary statistics using um, sort of as much as possible in silico data, I think. Um, so in this context, really, uh, I don't know, just to, to say a bit more, what's really going on in this context is that, um, so looking at the normalized pairwise correlations is that um, we only looked at data from five experiments and so the pairwise correlation often ends up just being hopelessly noisy and that's why you get the, the posterior uh, sort of the peak of the posterior being in a completely different place. So um, you can kind of generally come up with intuitive reasons why you're getting it wrong uh, too. So I, I think check within silico data um, and, and then use intuition as well. I don't know if that helps, but that's as far as I can go. So one last question. Well then, I have one last question. So you have these uh, three models and then you show that for different parameter values yeah. you get the same fit. Yeah. So how do we interpret the parameters that you get? Yeah, I mean, a, very, a really good point as well, and I sort of um, almost touched on that. Um, I think the key thing here is that maybe that means that any of these models are appropriate because if your aim is simply just to predict uh, the dynamics of this system, it, it might not matter which model you use, um, but you just do have to be careful that you're estimating the parameter kind of using the right, the right model. I think, right? So in this context, you can't just switch between models and naively expect the same parameters to, to make the same predictions. So yeah, it's a really good point, um, I think. 
okay, so let's uh, thank Ruth again.